Got your Bibles? Book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 35. I won't be there for a few minutes, Mike. I got to lay a little groundwork. Let me just go ahead and just lay it out there. You know, there's in this world that we live the ever-living battle of two supernatural beings. They both step out of eternity to enter time. Their conflict is played out in the hearts and minds of people. Their confrontation displayed on the prophetic backdrop of the preordained strategies of the Creator. God set this thing up for us to see. They poise themselves in the flow of their eternal natures and personalities. Their influence is seen in and around us every day. The personalities of what I would call givers and takers. One is love, the other is hate. One functions as light, the other has his deeds done in darkness. One has come to provide life, and that more abundantly, the other has come to steal, kill, and destroy. Mike, I don't know if that's on the slide, but if it is, put it up there. Amen. One has become, come to bless, the other to bruise. When you really narrow down the specifics of their characteristics, their personalities, and their nature, you'll find over and over again, one is a giver and one is a taker. When you look around you, there are only two kinds in the world. It's not black and white. It's not rich and poor. It's not upper class and lower class, educated, uneducated. There are really just two types of people in the world, givers and takers. Givers and takers. When I look over my life, that's what I see. I, I want you to stand with me for the reading of the word, and we'll get right into this. Acts chapter 20, verse 35. I have showed you that in all things how that so laboring you ought to support the weak. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, when I say this, I want you to notice the word weak. There are people that, right, it looks like they're takers, but if they ever get on their feet, they're going to be givers. All they need is a hand up, not a hand out. And if you can help them out. So Paul said, and in this passage, this is his third year in Ephesus. He's there. He's been teaching the gospel. He's been preaching. Now he's fixing to leave the people. Before he leaves them, he shares with them that I've worked hard. I've done the best I can. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Now watch this. Then he had thus spoken. He kneeled down and prayed with them all, and they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck. They kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they would never see his face no more, and they accompanied him into the ship. They were so moved by Paul that when he decided to leave them, and I've, always, I've been using this phrase a lot lately, every time's the last time. I just went hunting for the last time. I may never get to do it again. When I get on a bike, it's the last time. This morning may be the last time I ever get to preach to you. You don't know when the last time is, so you got to realize and make life about the last time. Amen. When you live that way, you're on the edge. These people had been with Paul for three years. Now he's fixing to leave them, and the Scripture says he made one more statement before he left. It's more blessed to give than to receive. And he began to lay this foundation in their life. Then they wept and tore themselves apart. I read this, and I began to tear up and realize that it's the people that have left my life that were givers that I have wept about. It's when the givers died. It's when the givers left that my heart was torn apart. I stand here, and I can tell you over and over again, I, every year I, I know who gives and who don't. And I'm not just talking about tithing. I'm talking about giving of their time, their treasures. They give of their talent. And when they go, my heart is broke. Because I say, God, if the givers keep going, all we got is takers. And God help us to keep people learning how to give and change our personalities to a place of giving. It's more blessed. Everybody say blessed. That means highly favored. That means more than anything else above anything else. You are blessed when you are a giver, when you learn to re let go of things. So there are two personalities. So you start walking through your Bible, and you see them. You see one that gives and one that takes. One that's, and listen, there's a huge difference in lifestyle. You, so you say, well, I, can't, I, can't. I am a poster child for somebody that come out of poverty, outhouses, Drew water up, had commodities. I, you know, again, my dad never told us we were poor. He never wanted us to know that. But, I mean, you, you, we had, I remember when we got an air conditioner in the house, it was in my daddy's room because he was the worker. We weren't working. We just moochers. I'm sorry, we were just kids. And kids come up as takers. How many know that? 
We just take, 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 take. But then you've got to get in a place in your life where you say, i got to reverse it because I've been handed up. Now i got to start putting back out. Father, take, you, take this word, what's in my heart, and let it impact uh, your people today. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Again, one is love, the other is hate. One functions like light. One is in darkness. One provides life. One came to kill, steal, and destroy. One has come to bless. The other to bruise. So you look at it. They are, uh, they are takers and they are givers. Let's talk about the taker. John 10, 10. The thief comes not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they may have life and that they may have life more abundantly. I've looked this passage up in every translation I can find. It never said Satan came to kill, steal, and destroy. It said the thief came which gave him a title that he was a thief. And they, his whole idea in life is taken. And you see it even before creation. Amen. Look in Isaiah chapter 14, and you'll get a little idea of his personality. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You sat in your heart. I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. This was his attitude. Verse 15, but you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. Those who see you stare at you. They ponder your faith. Is this the man who shook the earth and made kingdoms tremble? Isaiah talks about him. Other passages in the Old Testament talks about his I will, I will, always lifting up and always trying to take. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from the sky. I'm telling you that he was cast down, of course, with his demons. The taken will promise what only given can give you. When you take something, you think to yourself, well, that's what I'm after. If you will learn to give, it will be given to you. If you learn to give, I'm going to go take love. If you learn to give love, you'll get love. If you give peace, you'll get peace. But you try to take it, force it, then it's never going to happen. Satan's influence in the beginning, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did not, did God really say? Y'all know this already. I pray you do. You understand what's happening here. Adam and Eve's in the garden. God instructed them, don't touch the tree of life. Don't mess with that tree right there. You can have all the trees. Help yourself. Bananas, oranges, apples, uh, 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 anything you want out there. Just don't eat the peach. Well, y'all think it was an apple? You won't tempt me, it's going to be with a peach. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you'll die. You will not surely, you will not surely die. Do you read your Bible like that? You ought to. This serpent said to the woman, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, which evidently was standing right there with her. Don't throw it off on a weave. Because here's the man that ought to have been handling the household, and he's sitting here too. So Satan said, if you touch it, you'll be like God. If you take it, you'll be like God. The issue is this. They were already like God. When's the last time you understood? We, we were created in his image. We've already like him. So why we got to eat something else to make us more like him? If you eat this, you become more human. You're already human. Your, the issue was take it, take it. And you know what happened. They took the fruit. They understood they had sinned. They could have had it all. God got upset with them. Eve ate them out of a house at home. She ends up getting kicked out of the garden. Adam gets kicked out of the garden. It, it, and and they, uh, they, co they, they literally were naked then. They covered themselves. They felt shame. It all entered in at that time. Again, I don't have time. To, these are just points I want to make. Satan's influence in the first family, Genesis chapter 4. Adam lay with his wife, Eve. She became pregnant, gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to her brother, Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. 
In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Firstborn, again, is the term for tithing. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry. His face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, you will, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. When you walk through this, you realize if it matters to God, it ought to matter to us. And Cain, and Cain brings uh, some vegetables in, throws it out there. He gathered it up from the ground. He said, there you go. But, but here's a man who, who uh, raised calves, cows, uh, lamb, whatever. When he brings them up, he slaughters one. He brings the first thing into God. He offers it as a sacrifice. This is in the very beginning. We always know in our heart we've got to sacrifice. we got to praise. we got to worship. we got to connect with him. we got to please him in the things we do in life. Now, when I read this passage here, I realize two brothers, two siblings, and it's been going on from the beginning, that sibling rivalry. When one sibling's upset with the other sibling because they didn't get what they thought they should or didn't get the attention they thought they should. Listen, you cannot be fair with your kids. You can't. It's impossible unless you just got one. But you can't be fair if you've got a multiple group of kids. Because as you move through life, you either get more or have less. And so they, it's wherever you're at in life. As we got older in life, me and my, my brother and my sister, my dad, when he quit whooping me, he quit whooping my brother. That ain't fair. He had another year and a half worth of whoopings coming to him. It ain't fair how you do that. But, but that, anyway, you can't be fair with it. Here's what happens. Jealousy got out of hand. First in life, first this is important. When you see people, you respect. there's a respect that we have, and this is important, to respect people, to elevate a person, to look. And listen, this is where titles come in. Doctor, uh, professor, uh, teacher. Mr. Miss, these are, these are, when you put a title on something, when you give it pastor, president, first lady, when you put a title on something, you're giving it respect. Amen. That's why it's important to, to learn. And, and if you want to open a door, my daughter actually used a term to me the other day, yes, sir. I said, Mandy, if you'll keep using that word, it will open doors for you. When you learn to say, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. When you respect people, it will open. So here it is. It's important to respect. Then you admire them. You esteem a person. You begin to, to look at them and lift them up. Amen. It's a, it's a good thing, an appreciation of their giftings. You see giftings in them. You know, when you esteem somebody, you watch today during the Super Bowl. They'll begin to esteem people. They'll lift them up because of the giftings in their life. It doesn't matter anything else other than the giftings. Same way in our life. You can sing. Yeah, they, they lift you up. So my, my pastor. Pastor, he just had a birthday, and he went to see Fiddler on the Roof. If I were a rich man, da 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 da, da. Had that Russian not sung, he wouldn't have been admired. But he's esteemed. So it's important to understand that esteem has to do with your gifts. Now, here's the issue. What is when it gets out of hand? The pattern is, is to be like them is one thing. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. You can follow me. You can emulate some of my life. That, that's, that's okay. But, but here's the thing. Be careful what you emulate. I will, I will not, I will very seldom listen to other preachers. It's not because I can read my Bible, I can study my Bible, but my problem is when I read them, when I listen to them, I start acting like them. And I want to be me. I don't want to come over here and go, I can't get no help over here. I just can't get no help over here in this church area. You know, I, I, don't, I don't stand up here and act like Ken Holloway chewing my gum and calling y'all brothers and stuff like that. I don't want to do that. I want to be me. All right? So I've got to be careful not to emulate. This is what happened. They started getting out of hand. Then you start competing with them. Competition. Envy. You begin to envy the person. Cain was a taker versus Abel who was a giver. He had discontent toward him. Amen. Because God made him more superior because this man had learned how to give. Takers 
actually, and if you ever, never change your personality, your nature, you will always hate givers. You need givers, but you'll hate them because they always give and, and you're always trying to take it, get hold of somebody else's stuff. And then if you're not careful, whatever you choose to emulate, then you will try to eliminate. You will try to murder them. You'll try to remove them all so that you can be the front one. Here's what Cain thought. If I can get rid of Abel, then God will see me and say, okay, there's my boy there. He, whatever he's got, I'm for him because Cain's not here anymore. Problem is, God sees all and when he saw Cain he said where's your brother that was rhetorical when God asks a question it is always rhetorical he know the answer when he asked it so when he asked a question where's your brother I don't know where he said his, he said his blood is crying out from the ground what you've done to him was wrong and even into the New Testament it speaks of the blood of Abel if Cain were Abel he would have never killed his brother Abel he, you know, he witnessed Abel's joy. He, he had the favor with, uh, with God that, listen, principles do matter. Jealousy leads to hatred. Hatred leads to anger. Anger leads to murder. This is why your preacher is always talking about forgiveness. Because if not, you will murder them. In your mind, in your thoughts, in your language, you'll try to figure out a way to eliminate. You know, I, and I, I got siblings in my life. I see them, you know, and there's always that little bickering and fighting, but every now and then there's that joy. It's life. You got to deal with it. But you got to set your own identity and realize, you know what, my personality has become that someday of a giver and not just a taker. Amen? Listen to me. Eliminating people will not solve your problem. You know, if I could just kill Abel, I won't have no more problems. Getting rid of certain people in your life is not going to eliminate your problem. Amen. That God will raise up somebody worse than them. Man, as a pastor for now 26 years, there have been certain people in my life I said, Dear God, if you just let them backslide. Amen. If you just let another preacher come along and take them off my hands. Or at worst, God, just kill them. And God won't do it. And if they ever left, somebody worse than them shows up. They're worse taker than the taker I was trying to get rid of. Come on. Amen. So, so you got to be getting rid of people in your life. You, you can get upset. Yeah, you got. I, 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 I'm going to make a statement that I, I, I pray I don't regret ever. But in 26 years of pastoring, I have never fired anyone. Never fired anyone. Hired lots of people. I've probably had 50, 60 employees, but I've never fired one. I've allowed them to quit. I've allowed life to realize to them that they don't belong where we're at or that they came to a place in life they outgrowed us or they were needing to move on into other ministries. But I never wanted to just fire them because I thought to myself, and you know, and I understand there's times for that. There's a need for that at times it's because it, it contaminates the pool. I understand. Uh, many of you business owners, you've got to do what you've got to do. But in my life, in my line of work, I'm thinking this book's got to work. So if I keep working with them and working with them and working with them, perhaps one day I can see them turn and change. Amen. And if they don't, then, then there is another place for them. And that, thank God for the body of Christ that there is that. James 1.19 says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. For anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. As a matter of fact, anger brings forth death. So if you don't deal with your anger properly, it will bring forth murder. You've got to deal with that. Satan had influence in Israel. Joshua chapter 7, verse 1. Let me set you up for this real quick. Joshua, man, they, they had gone for out of, we talked about this uh, Tuesday night. Out of the land of not enough, through the land of just enough, to get to the land of more than enough. They're right on the edge of the Jordan River. Joshua and his men, Moses is dead now. Joshua's fixed to lead them across. He's got Caleb with him. All the other uh, spies, the other ten spies that, that went out and spied the land, they're all dead. They get to the edge of the promised land. God has them uh, uh, deal with their flesh, things of that nature. They prepare to go in. They lift up the ark. They put their feet in the water. The Jordan parts during flood stage. My goodness, they go into Jericho. How are we going to handle this? God says march six times around on six days. On the seventh day, march seven times around. Thirteen laps to victory. Then shout and watch what happens. The walls come down. They go in and get everything. Now, if you listen, you listen. God says that whole city, the whole land's yours. But, 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 listen. Do not touch do not touch the sacred things in that place. Don't you steal anything. The first, the first Jericho is mine. Then after that, everything else is yours. This is mine. This is yours. Now you say, God, you own the whole earth. You, you're the God of the universe. No, no, he's teaching you, not him. It ain't about him. It's about us. 
So he said, look, when you go in, don't touch the city. It belongs to me. Everything in it is sacred unto me. Achan goes in, one of the guys, and he steals a couple of jackets and some coins and things like that, and he hides them under his tent. And it looks like everything is good until they get ready to go fight against Ai. As they prepare to go fight Ai, they send out just a small group of men. They believe that God, listen, God has already beat, uh, beat this first one. This ain't going to be a problem. 36 men die. When they get back to there, they tell Joshua, we couldn't take it. 36 men are dead. We couldn't take it. It's a smaller place in Jericho. The Bible says Joshua rent his coat. He, 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 threw, he got upset. He got mad. He says he was, he was upset over the thing that took place, and he, he began to question God. Why? You see it. He had never lost. He had never lost. When you lose, you need to ask yourself, why did I lose? Why, why did I lose that contract? Why did I lose that situation? Why did I lose that friend? Why did I lose? Because I, I'm not, God's people are designed to win. God made us to win. Now, we don't, if we lose, we just don't wallow in our losses. All right? So the, the loss, here's Joshua. He gets up and says, man, something's going on here. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. That was the tithe, the, the first of, the, uh, of Jericho. For Achan, the son of Karma, the son of uh, Zabde, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, what did he do? Say that word. Say it loud. Took. Say it again. Took of the accursed things, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Again, when you walk through that, you see it. He took something. He was a taker. And in taking, he caused the death of not only these men that had died, the fathers, the husbands, the uncles that had died because of his selfishness had taken. Actually, after that, him, his wife, his children, and all of his animals were stoned to death in order to calm the anger of God because he took something. Now, whew, thank God that's Old Testament. Let's go to New Testament. Let me scare you. Acts 5, 1. You remember all the, uh, the churches exploding? Thousands of people are getting saved. People are giving and they're doing things and they're selling things off. As a matter of fact, let, let me mention this to you here. I think it's on Acts chapter 4, verse 36. It says, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas. Remember Barnabas, which means the son of encouragement? Sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 5. So Acts 4 tells you that a man had sold some things and brought it into the apostles' feet for it to be shared among the church folk that needed it. So Acts 5, there's a couple named Ananias and Sapphira. They look at the situation and they say, you know what? You see, cra- when you give, it's not to be looked at. It's not to be, hey, look at me, what I'm doing. I mean, that's, that's always the wrong thing to do. But give. Learn how to give. And and in this situation, Acts 5 says, Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Now listen to me. The situation is this. You sell your land, keep it. Don't say nothing about it. But don't say to God that I'm going to sell this and give all this to you or 10% to you, or 50% to you, and then lie about it. Woo. With his wife's full knowledge. He, <laughs> this gets scary. Verse 3. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart? There's that taker again. Always teaching people to take. That you have lied to the Holy Ghost and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, was it the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias heard this. He fell down and died, had a heart attack. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then the young men came forward and wrapped up his body and carried him out and buried him. About three hours, that's how long it took him to dig a six-foot grave. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you agree to test the Spirit of the Lord? 
Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all those who heard about these events. You always get nervous when you see an ambulance at a church. It's happened a few times in my life where, where somebody passed out or something happened and the ambulance shows up. But imagine that scene right here that somebody said, you know what happened at the little country church this morning? Oh, my goodness. Sounds Old Testament, don't it? You ought to thank God that you can walk in any house of God. And then God's got you covered. Amen. I, I, he had done killed us a hundred times over. Amen. But when I look at this, piss, uh, this passage, I realize the whole church, the whole church is now scared. Everybody's walking in fear. I would have promised you something. Giving went up at Sunday. Amen. Giving went up. I mean, folk were getting hold of this principle. They were understanding. Don't you lie to God. If you tell God you're going to do something, then you do it. Others had been doing this. Barnabas had doing this. Listen, here's, here's one of our problems again. We, don't buy your wants and beg your needs. A lot of folk buy their wants. They, they, they buy whatever they want. And now let me get personal. They'll buy their cigarettes. They'll buy their liquor. They'll buy, they'll buy the cottage cheese. They'll buy, they'll buy whatever drinks they want. They'll buy what it don't matter. It don't have to be on sale. They just buy whatever they want. And then when things get rough on them, would you help me with my power bill? Will you help me with this bill? Will you help me with that? They will buy their wants and beg their needs. And then turn around and tell God that God tithing don't work. I told you better find a round room this morning because I'm going to corner you. Listen, God can't pour his blessings out on someone who has no self-control, no restraints, and no patience. Don't blame God for your dysfunction. Man, when you go through things in life, you need to realize that principles do matter. If you're going to be in the house, learn the house. The personality of a giver is simple. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave he's a giver god is a giver he's a giver of life that's why us taking life is wrong he is always giving life he created man from the dust of the earth he breathed he gave life to man in ephesians chapter 4 verse 7 amen josiah let's get ready here in ephesians 4 7 but to each one of us grace has been given as given everybody say given as Christ apportioned it, God has given us grace. He's given us gifts. This is why it says, then he ascended on high. He took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave, gave the apostles, the prophets, the event. You may not like me, but I'm a gift. Huh. Amen. You may not like him. But he's a gift. Everybody here is a gift that God gave. He said God gave some gifts, and these were the gifts he gave. Apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. What? To equip the people for works of ministry so that the body of Christ might be built up. My goal in life is to build you up that you may build other people up until we all reach the unity and the faith together. We get this together. Cain and Abel were not together. We have to get the. I want a pastor a whole church full of givers. I'm not talking about just tithing. Tithing is the minimum of what we can do. I'm talking about giving, giving of our life, our time, our talent, love, kindness. When, when somebody passes, to care about them, to stand next to people, to make sure your heart's always out toward you. Not about what I can take, what I can get back from it. Sure, whatever you sow, you're going to reap. But if we had learned to give, and I thank God for this house. You can't do what we've done over the last 16, 15 years now, and not done it without givers. This church was remodeled out of givers. Amen. The, the place in New Caney, it was givers that done that. Amen. They, it, and listen, by all means, we will always have some folk that are takers, and at times that's all right because I'm believing God that eventually they're going to become givers also. Amen. I had to take it one time in my life. I had to take somebody else's room to live in. I had to take a vehicle to drive. And I, it... it, it, it it's against everything I am to take. I, but, I, but when you have to, you have to. Pastor Mike said, what are you going to do on your birthday? I said, seriously, I want to go away and hide. 
just get away for a day by myself, amen, and then show back up on Saturdays if it never happened. Givers live with the presence of God. 2 Samuel 6, verse 10. He was not willing. You remember when Uzzah come? You, we did a, 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 a muscle car Sunday on him. Uzzah touched the ark. The ark killed him. David said, what in the world just happened? This would be a good series to preach on later. But, but the scripture says that he took the ark and he brought it to a guy's house named Obed-Edom. I like saying Obed-Edom. Even that's just a cool name. He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite for three months, and the Lord blessed him and his entire household. What's that tell you? That Obed-Edom lived with the presence of God. The ark for 90 days, his house was blessed. Amen. God blessed. If you keep the presence of God in your life, you're going to stay blessed. I don't know how it happened. I bet Obed-Edom was, was near bankruptcy. And all of a sudden, his wife looked in the living room and said, What in the world have you brought in this house? And he said, Well, King David brought that thing in here. It's just a box, but it represents the presence of God. Well, you better not. He said, Baby, whatever you do, when you dust this house, don't touch that box. When you, when you do the floor in this house, don't touch that box. I'm telling you, I saw bad problems with that box. He said, don't touch it. And then he goes out into the garden, and he looks out, and all of a sudden sprigs are popping up around his garden. And things that weren't there yesterday begin to accelerate around. And all of a sudden he looked over, and one of his cows just had a calf. Cows and calves, that meant prosperity. And the next thing he knows, he, somebody comes over and says, man, that's a fine-looking cow. I'll give you twice as much as you paid for it. And he goes back in the house the next day. He said, baby, I don't know what's happening. But I'm a, I'm a blessed man. He goes back out the next day, and there's more crops coming up, and he gets another parcel of land, and things just start happening. He goes and opens the mailbox, and some lost love when he, met, he ain't met in years leaves him a check. Oh, second day, baby, I don't know what's happening. But I'm going to tell you something, that box is staying right there. Amen. I'm going to stay in the presence of the Lord because as long as the presence is here, God is blessing me. I have found out this. If you can stay in the presence of God, if you can stick with the favor of God in your life, God will find a way to bless you. Amen. Your crops come up. Your, your animals last. Uh, it it, it rains on somebody else. And you will go. Oh, my goodness. We'll preach that later. The scripture says, give and it will be given to you. If you learn to give, it's going to come. If you become a giver, a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured back into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So if I take a spoon and I, I give a spoon's worth of seed, I get a spoon further back but if I learn to use a shovel then I'm going to get a lot more back it's my measure God said it's up to you let me say this to you again for those that didn't catch tithing is the, is the minimal it's the minimal many folk act like it's the max it's the minimal that we can do so when I catch this that God's always going to and you say well pastor I'm already blessed I don't need to do that okay you want you to do it to honor God and watch and see what happens I close with this. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, and I don't want to read it out of the message. Remember, a stingy planter gets a stingy crop. A lavish planter gets a lavish crop. I want each of you to take plenty of time to think this over. Make up your mind what you're going to give. That will protect you against sob stories and arm twisting. Don't catch it? That means when I come to church, I don't have to get up here and say, Oh, sir, if you don't give today, we're not going to be able to pay the power bill. David ain't going to get nothing. Joseph can't bring his little girl to the hospital. Oh, sir. I've been in churches like that. Decide when you get here what you are already going to give. Based on your honor and love for God. Decide. Make up your mind. No, I'm going to wait and watch him preach and see how good the preaching is. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Some of you have been burnt in church. I know that. But if you can get this principle, it ain't about just the church. It's life, period. Be a giver. Be a giver. If God has blessed you, be a giver. He said, well, I don't feel real blessed. Start with a little. Start with a dime on a dollar. Uh, I just talked 
with someone this week. They had a young girl in his church came and gave $11,000 tithe off of a bonus. See, this girl's in her 40s, but she started tithing when she was 18. And God has escalated her life to all she knows how to do is give back to. He said she will hunt me down to make sure that tithe gets into that church because she's connected to the covenant. And that's changed her life. I want you to, I want each of you to take a little time. No sob stories. God loves it when the giver delights in the giving. God can pour on the blessings in astonishing ways so that you're ready for anything and everything. More than just ready to do what needs to be done. As one psalmist puts it, he throws caution to the wind, given to the needy in reckless abandon. His right living, right giving, ways never run out, never wear out. This most generous God who gives seed to the farmer that becomes bread for your meals is more than extravagant with you. He gives you something you can then give away, which grows into full-form lives, robust in God. Wealthy in every way, so that you can be generous in every way, producing with us great praise to God. Again, I read this from a man who lived in prison, lived on a boat, lived in borrowed houses, was beaten, shipwrecked, incarcerated, the threat of his head being gone. And he still says, you know what made my life different than everybody else? It's more blessed to give than to receive. Stand with me. I like the fact that most of you know me. I like the fact that you know me. So I close with this statement. A man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. You can argue with me all day long that sowing doesn't work. I promise you. I promise you. I have experienced the power of sowing and reaping. That when I have sowed into places and into people's lives, and again, I'm, I'm separating a lot of this from the church. My 10% comes here, but that's a lot more of my money goes elsewhere that I sow into other people. And if you learn to sow, if you learn to be, you're talking about a smile on your face. Some of you want to be that person. You want to be that giver. Well, we give our time. We give our talent. We give our threat. We give our smiles. But you got to start somewhere. You know the problem with addiction? Addiction is about taking. It's all about, and, I, and my heart breaks for those that are addicted. I've been addicted. I understand it. But when you're addicted to things, you're always taking. You're always say, and you'll say it over and over. I don't mean to do that. I don't mean to do that. And you'll take and you'll take and you'll take. This is what I see, the personality of Satan, the personality of God. One's always about taking. The other one's always about giving. Heads bowed and eyes closed for a moment. Just you and God for a moment. Would you consecrate yourself? God, make me a giver. Change my personality. You are a God of change. You, you can change me. You can take what's twisted inside of me and make it straight. You can take what's low inside of me and raise it up. You can take what's empty inside of me and fill it. God, you're always giving to me. You're giving me life. You're giving me joy. You gave me family. Tagged on a couple of grandkids. God, you're a giver to my life. Make me a giver. Help me understand the importance of that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give God a praise. Be seated for a brief moment. Our servant leaders are coming up.